Well, I'm going to start you off with a fact. Not an alternative fact, but a fact. <laughs> John Wooden was the greatest coach in the history of American sport. To give you some of, yeah, thank you. He is the fabric of the legacy that we all share as Bruins. He set records that will never be equal. Ten championships in 12 years, 88 straight games, 38 straight games in the NCAA tournament. Wow. Who will ever do that? And when he retired in 1975, in fact, he didn't really stop work, and he just kept teaching this unique philosophy that led to that enormous success in Pauley Pavilion. And the essence of that philosophy, his pyramid of success, is based on a definition of success very different than what most of us grew up with. We grew up with Mr. Webster's definition, the attainment of money, power, and fame. And yet I had the unique opportunity to work in the entertainment industry and know that a lot of people who are rich, powerful, and famous were amongst the most miserable people I ever met in my life. <laughs> Coach's definition is different. Coach's definition is that success is, in fact, peace of mind that you only get through knowing that you've done your best to be the best that you're capable of being. Your competition in life is with no one other than that potential that resides within you. That's what led to all those championships, but it also led to this opinion. He was the happiest, most fulfilled person I ever met. So let me tell you a little bit about my backstory with Coach. As Dr. Strauss mentioned, I grew up about a mile away from here, dreaming of going to UCLA, not playing basketball, but going to school here. And I guess I got pretty good and ended up getting a chance to come to UCLA and play for the great John Wooden. What a dream, a dream come true. I played freshman basketball. I was the most valuable player with Henry Bibby. I couldn't wait. And then I spent the next three years planted firmly on the bench, <laughs> watching the Bruins go 87-3 and three and win in three national championships. I'm one of 13 men who've been on three championship teams. No big surprise, the other 12 they all played for John Wooden. And what we learn beyond this basic philosophy of life about being your best is that in fact in that pursuit of excellence that that's where our real happiness comes in. So I come up to school here, I meet coach, I play, I sit on the bench for three years and honestly thought that's it for me and coach, see you later. He was a professor in my favorite class and he flunked me three times straight. After all, who wants to go see that guy? So I left UCLA, I went into the entertainment business, had some success, got very lucky and got fired. Gave me an opportunity to really examine how had I gotten where I got in the entertainment business and realized that I was really good at getting a group of people to work towards a common goal. And I guess that sounded familiar. And I realized that everything I knew, everything I believed in, was a result of this man who I thought I didn't like and it didn't like me. But 25 years or no 25 years, I knew I had to pick up the phone and call him to thank him for what he'd given me. Now I had a phone number, but it was old. It was 25 years old. Remember the old days? It didn't have an area code in front of it. But I knew if there was one guy who hadn't moved, it was Coach. And I'd made difficult calls running a studio Fired people, canceled shows, but no call had ever made me that anxious. The idea of calling up Coach and not just eating crow, but eating a boxcar filled with crows to say, Coach, you were right and I was wrong. Thank you. Well, it took me about a day. I finally dialed a phone. It rang a few times. And then when you're really anxious about a phone call, the greatest thing happened that could possibly happen, the answering machine picked up. <laughs> and great, I just have to leave a message. Well, the thing beeped and a little message plays, and I go, hi, coach, this is Andy Hill. Now, keep in mind, I, 25 years is a long time. I thought he might not remember me. Even worse, I thought he would remember me and thought, who wants to talk to that guy? <laughs> well, the phone picks up, and I go, hi, coach, this is Andy Hill, and bang, he picks that thing up so fast you can't believe it. That crafty old dude screened his calls. <laughs> and we went right back to where we left off 25 years ago. He said, hey, where are you? I said, what do you mean, where am I? Where are you? 
and then something happened and changed my life. I heard a caring, an interest, a concern on the other end of the phone. I never could have imagined. He said, Andy, when are you going to come see your old coach? I miss you. Well, I went to see him the next day. We spent about five hours together talking about leadership and life. And at the end of those five hours, I went downstairs to my car, drove outside, and there was coach up in the balcony waving goodbye. I drove around the corner. I turned my car off. I cried for about 10 minutes. Wow, I had reconnected with someone in my life who could be a mentor in a way I didn't have. And so what a thrill that I got to spend the next 14 years with John Wooden. And what a wonderful thing to be here today because he passed just upstairs. So I feel like he's right here with us. So what did I really learn from Coach, this idea that you could keep getting better? Well, a lot of it came from his own dad. He gave him, when he graduated from grade school, two lists of threes. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. And the other one, which he actually really invoked, don't whine, don't complain, don't make excuses. Which even as he aged and dealt with lots of illnesses, boy, the one thing you never heard from Coach was a complaint. What you heard from him was gratitude. He also, by the way, wasn't afraid of dying. He talked about it a lot. And he had great faith. You know, you can imagine when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, and this old guy, by the way, younger than me today, but this old guy kept telling us that the three most important things in our life were our family, our friends, and our faith. Now, come on, when you're 18 years old, what is it? It's girls and basketball, or if you're really into hoops, basketball and girls. Family, friends, and faith were what Coach's whole life was about. He had grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and all these alumni around him, which gave him great joy. But at the end of the day, Coach's life and his lesson about aging is the same as his lesson about life. It's about changing and getting better. Now, before I get into that, because change is hard, and that's a problem. We all like to be right. Now, I don't want to get anybody in trouble here, but if any of you here ever used this line, you knew who I was when you married me. <laughs> you know what coaches say? That's pathetic. But the truth is, it's very powerful. Because if you believe you aren't going to change, you're always right. And if you think you can, you're just getting started. It's not easy to change. It's hard. So I want to tell you a few stories about change, the nature of change. First one is about having a sense of urgency to change, to get better. Coach, whether you know it or not, was the most romantic man I ever met. Married to Nellie for 55 years. When she passed, on the 21st of each month, she'd write her a love letter, put her under her pillow. So years later, I asked Coach, do you have any regrets in life? And he had one really fast. He said, oh, yes. He said, you know, my Nellie, oh, she loved to dance. And I never learned how. I was a shy farm boy. Now, if Coach had another round at it, he'd be on Dancing with the Stars. I promise you. But he didn't do it. You have to approach change with a sense of, I'm going to get it done. Because if you approach it with the sense of, I'm going to do it later, just say, forget about it, I'm not doing it. You have to be urgent. The next one is, what does change look like? Most of us aren't very good at it. After I'd become really close with Coach, I got to write a book with him. And as part of the book tour, we're doing a show in Burbank. So I go over to his house, I pick him up in my wife's big SUV, and we're driving to Burbank. Keep in mind, we've become really close now. And we're on the 134 freeway. And I knew at this point that part of my problem with Coach was when I had come to UCLA, I, I was looking for a dad. Coach was looking for a point guard. <laughs> we had really missed. So Coach says, uh, out of the blue, as we're driving up the freeway, Andy, have I ever told you 
how much I love you? Have I ever told you how much I appreciate that you picked up the phone and called me? I should have called you. Well, the first thing that went through my mind was I was going to drive right off the freeway, but I was in my wife's car. I knew I couldn't do that. Next thing was I thought I was going to cry. I'd waited my whole life to hear these words. Now I'm hearing them from John Wooden. Whew, wow! But I knew if I started to cry, I would freak that old dude out. So I took a deep breath. I said, you know, Coach, no, you've never said that before. I've seen it in your eyes. I felt it in your hug. But to hear you express those emotions, thank you. I love you, too. It's what 95-year-old John Wooden said to me I want you to think about. He said, you know, I've been working on expressing my emotions. I think I'm getting a little better at it. <laughs> That's what change looks like. It's small, it's incremental, and it happens every day. Coach had this great expression, make each day your masterpiece. Your masterpiece is you. It's your life. Keep painting. Keep making it better. What I want to close with is the last speech John wouldn't ever make. Now, he's the greatest speaker I ever saw. He was getting an award as the greatest coach of all time. And he was dying. He was 98. So instead of having it in Pauley Pavilion, we had it in a little restaurant that seated 40. But his last speech, what did he say? Well, the first thing he did, he looked over at his players. There were 10 of us there. He said, I don't think I deserve the credit. He said, I'd like to think I helped. I was sitting next to a guy you may have heard of, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I had one of these little NCA watches. I said, hey, Kareem, I got three of these. You got three. Doesn't he have 10? Kareem said, you bet he does. It's why we both have three. Giving credit to others, though, that was natural for coach. But the next thing he said, like Linda was talking about identifying Alzheimer's when it happens, he made me nervous. He said, oh, I want you to know, I made a big mistake in my pyramid of success. And I thought, uh-oh. But in fact, he wanted us to know. He left the most important word in the English language out of his pyramid of success. That word is love, L-O-V-E. Not love as an emotion, love as an action. When you go to a wedding, they read from 1 Corinthians, love that's patient and kind, doesn't boast, doesn't envy. That was coach. And of course, he always used poems, and he had all these expressions, so he threw one in. A song and a song until you sing it. A bell isn't a bell until you ring it. And the love that's inside you wasn't put there to stay. Love is in love till you give it away. Well, uh, I was starting to cry, so was everybody else. But where did John wouldn't end? He was flickering right before our eyes. But what's the very last thing, the happiest guy I ever met in my life said to us? He looked over at his boys, for whom he had been everything a teacher, a mentor, a friend. And he looked over at us and he said, you know, guys, I just have one regret. I wish I'd done a little more. I just wish I'd done a little bit more. John Wooden's life was about two words, love and service. Keep changing. Keep getting better. Devote your life to others and service and happiness just like John wouldn't have had it, it will come your way. Thank you. God bless.